The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, typically just referred to as the Chinese Cultural Revolution, is one of the most politically contentious events of the 20th century. It took place 17 years after the creation of the People's Republic of China, which was officially established in 1949 after the Communists achieved victory over the KMT Nationalists in the Chinese Civil War, who then fled to the island of Taiwan. The Chinese Cultural Revolution did not officially begin until 1966, and it officially lasted until 1976. While the Cultural Revolution technically lasted about 10 years, most scholars agree that it really only lasted about 2 years, as its mass phase, known as the Radical Period, only lasted between 1966 to 1968. From there, it basically devolved into a period of factional warfare, resembling a civil war. When it was finally put down by the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, the Cultural Revolution is an extremely bewildering period of history that is deeply misunderstood, and almost all videos about it on YouTube are very poorly researched and very oversimplified. The purpose of this video is to explain what the Cultural Revolution actually was, how it unraveled, what Mao's intentions were with it, and what lessons can be learned from it, what was awful about it, and what was good about it. So watch until the end of the video to get the full picture. This is a story of a revolution within a revolution, an unprecedented event that handed an enormous amount of power to the masses and led a plurality of short-lived egalitarian organizations and fascinating experiments in communist projects. The story is also, however, a tragedy of mass hysteria, mob violence, psychological trauma, self-sabotage, cannibalization, paranoia, resentment, and leftist infighting like you have never seen before. It is an extremely contradictory event, characterized simultaneously by anti-authoritarianism and authoritarianism, freedom of speech and self-censorship, creativity and destruction, naive utopianism and cynical opportunism, hyper-politicization and, surprisingly, depoliticization. This video is, above all, the fascinating story of what is a deeply misunderstood period of history that presents us with many crucial lessons, sobering lessons. This is the story of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. This video documentary was originally inspired by an essay on the Cultural Revolution that I wrote and recently published in a book titled Underground Theory. This book features some very famous authors, such as Slavoj Žižek, and some small up-and-coming underground authors, like myself. Though this video documentary is quite different from the essay and is made to be much more accessible to a broader audience. If you want to support my work in other ways, you can always become a patron, where you can get access to exclusive content and help make it possible for one time to become a full-time project so that I can upload high-quality videos more often. Shortly after Mao's death in 1976 and the prosecution of the Gang of Four, Mao's loyalists, the post-Mao CPC, headed by Deng Xiaoping, set an official verdict on the Cultural Revolution as a, quote, 10-year catastrophe, responsible for, quote, the most severe setbacks and heaviest losses suffered by the party, the state, and the people since the founding of the People's Republic. The CPC has enforced this official narrative and foreclosed any inquiry or discourse regarding alternative interpretations of it through vigorous state censorship on the subject along with a dissemination of state-sanctioned propaganda. Of course, the ruling elite of the CPC and China's new ruling class have a vested financial and political interest in doing this. Yet the Communist Party of China still proclaims to be socialist and avoids condemning Mao directly still co-opting Mao Zedong iconography, and largely portraying Mao as a national hero who just made a few mistakes. This is all part of their effort to restore the legitimacy of the party state, which was greatly damaged by the mass rebellions of the Cultural Revolution. This is why Chinese state authorities have prohibited the publishing of books on the Cultural Revolution that depict it in ways that are not approved by party departments. Although clearly one-sided, the official Chinese state narrative of the Cultural Revolution being a time of anarchic chaos is comparatively more accurate and less convoluted than most Western narratives of the Cultural Revolution, which insists on depicting it as totalitarian to fit the general anti-communist theme of painting all communist experiments with one broad brush. The dominant Western account of the Chinese Cultural Revolution generally goes as follows. After the failure of the infamous Great Leap Forward, Mao lost a lot of political legitimacy within the CPC. The Great Leap Forward was an ambitious plan that attempted to industrialize the productive forces of China while simultaneously building egalitarian social relations that ended in a catastrophic famine leading to the starvation of millions. 
Reported numbers of this famine claimed by many Western scholars tends to be greatly exaggerated, and there are many multifaceted reasons for why this famine occurred. It was nonetheless a significant failure, and Mao had a lot of responsibility for this because he was the one who really pushed for this policy despite it not being very popular among a lot of the people in his party. So after the failure of the Great Leap Forward, Mao was able to keep his symbolic status as the party chairman, but he withdrew from the head of state in favor of Liu Xiaoxi, veteran leader of the communist underground during the Chinese Civil War. But he supported more moderate mixed economy policies in the transition, which Mao opposed. Even though Mao's real political power was significantly reduced, Mao was still symbolically the top guy. This was due to his massive public prestige. To give you an idea as to just how much prestige Mao had in China at the time, he was basically like Lenin or Che Guevara if they never died. Mao had the legendary status as the founder of the People's Republic of China, and the great leader who fought against the Japanese and the nationalists. He had been both a military strategist and an intellectual theoretician. Not so good with economics though. But he had very little actual political power, in terms of decision making, as daily administration was now in the hands of President Liu Xiaoxi and the party secretary general Deng Xiaoping, who were seen as more competent managers of the economy. Mao was supposed to be consulted on major decisions, but his ideas were no longer usually followed, and he complained that he felt, quote, like a corpse at a funeral. From here, most Western historical accounts of the Cultural Revolution assert that Mao began plotting a Machiavellian strategy to restore absolute power. And many argue that Mao's motives behind this were provoked by events that occurred in the Soviet Union. Mao's paranoia allegedly started with Nikita Khrushchev's secret speech, which denounced Stalin's crimes and the cult of personality after his death. Mao was afraid that the same thing would happen to his legacy, and he became even more paranoid about 10 years after, when Nikita Khrushchev was later displaced by Brezhnev in a soft coup. And this culminated in the Sino-Soviet split, which occurred for a wide variety of reasons, but it was presented as a conflict over revisionism. The accusation was that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union under Khrushchev abandoned class struggle. From here, most popular narratives suggest that Mao used revisionism and the paranoia that capitalism would be restored as excuses to mobilize his supporters, aka the Red Guards, against his political rivals so that he could ascend back to power. As is often the case with many historical narratives, these narratives contain a kernel of truth. However, they don't tell you the full story, and they end up portraying a quite inaccurate picture of the Cultural Revolution, which tries to pin everything on Mao's personality and not the masses themselves. Such one-dimensional narratives, often believed by both the right and the left, completely ignore the agency of the masses themselves in advancing the most remarkable achievements of the Cultural Revolution, as well as its most destructive elements. Before uncovering the true story of how the Cultural Revolution began, how it transpired, and its aftermath, it is helpful to first highlight some overlooked aspects of Communist China under Mao before the Cultural Revolution, and how it differed from the USSR under Stalin. Already well before the Cultural Revolution, what became known as Mao Zedong thought was already a notable deviation from Soviet-style Marxism-Leninism. Attempts to put Mao Zedong thought in practice would eventually become known as Maoism. Mao Zedong encouraged people to never forget class struggle, and placed a greater emphasis on the masses taking the leading role in the transformation towards communism. Mao also placed a far greater emphasis on the peasantry, which had been long neglected throughout Chinese history. Mao stressed that peasants, workers, students, and party leaders must all learn from each other. He believed that the party must learn from the masses so that they would not become out of touch with them. The method of putting this into practice would become known as the mass line, in which party leaders are to spend time with the masses in different areas, such as factories and farms, to take note of their sentiments and then consider them when reformulating their policy programs, which they would then present to the masses again accordingly, after having made the adjustments. Aside from Mao's differences from Stalin, China was structured quite differently from the USSR. It was structured a bit less dictatorially, with the functions of the head of state being divided among different powerful figures. Mao simply did not wield the kind of dictatorial power that Stalin did. But nevertheless, the Communist Party of China still ran a one-party dictatorship, with the Chinese constitution granting the CPC the supreme authority to rule China indefinitely. The power of the CPC, however, would be greatly challenged by the Cultural Revolution, as it gave unprecedented power to the masses, fostering a political climate that was anything but totalitarian, but nonetheless terrifying. The Cultural Revolution marked the greatest challenge to the Chinese Communist Party's authority in history. 
While the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution became one of the largest mass movements in history, taking on a highly anarchic, decentralized character, it began for the most part as a revolution from above. It was initially facilitated but not controlled by the party center, and it wasn't long before it took on a life of its own far beyond the control of Mao or his party. Most scholars agree that the main series of events that led up to the Cultural Revolution occurred between 1965 and 1966 and they were ignited by a highly politicized debate surrounding a play called Hai Rui Dismissed from Office. The play had been written five years earlier by a man named Wu Han, who was a historian, playwright, and politician. The play Hai Rui Dismissed from Office was an allegorical drama set in the Ming Dynasty, and it celebrated the heroism of a virtuous official who had been deposed by a tyrannical emperor for having spoke out against him. Initially, Mao actually loved this play. But many people in his circle eventually interpreted it as being an implicit critique of Chairman Mao and his dismissal of the party members who spoke out against his great leap forward. The first discussions of a great proletarian cultural revolution in China were heard in November 1965, when the literary critic named Yao Wenyuan, on behalf of Mao and his wife, Jian Qing, wrote a critique of this play. Yao's criticism of this play was not just that it was implicitly about Chairman Mao, but rather the main criticisms was that the play portrayed peasants as politically impotent and in need of saving by benign bureaucrats, among other things that leftists disliked. This critique ignited a discourse that became highly political, known as the Hai Rui controversy. It brought long-standing grievances to the surface, provoking public debates surrounding the corruption of party officials, China's revolutionary path, and concerns regarding elements of bourgeois or feudal elements in Chinese culture that were said to be holding back the transition to communism. This controversy would go on to set the stage for the Cultural Revolution. Mao used the Hai Rui affair to bolster a critique that he had been voicing for a long time, which was that the existing state and party apparatus was allegedly dominated by bourgeois ideology and threatened to reproduce capitalist-type socioeconomic relationships in society at large. Mao believed that the Chinese Revolution had reached a point of stasis. Mao argued that a regression away from communism could only be avoided by raising the political consciousness of the masses, by revitalizing the socialist spirit and ideals of the revolution, and by refashioning a state structure guided by so-called proletarian ideology. Following the onslaught of scathing critiques of the Hai Rui play catalyzed by Yao Wenyuan's essay, the Communist Party apparatus started to get a lot of heat from the public due to censoring the essay for weeks despite Mao's objections. So Mao used the Hai Rui incident and the debates that it had provoked to first call for a cultural revolution in 1965, initially pursuing a revolution in the superstructure, the field of culture and ideology. Remember, during this time, Mao did not actually have that much real political power. But he had a lot of prestige, and with the help of his allies in Beijing and Shanghai, Mao was able to get rid of conservative elements from the cultural state apparatuses, such as state instruments and educational institutions that controlled the flow of information. This included a purge of conservative elements in the ministries of culture and departments involving propaganda, such as the authoritative media outlet The People's Daily, which was one of the party's main mouthpieces. Under the direction of the newly created Cultural Revolution Group, the CCRG, Mao Zedong loyalists now effectively controlled the country's main organs of communication. The Cultural Revolution Group was a quasi-official agency established to guide the Cultural Revolution, and in the process, it assumed many of the powers of the party's central committee and the Politburo. It was essentially Mao's clique. It was headed by a few pro-Mao figures who had become greatly important during the Cultural Revolution, including Jian Qing, Mao's wife, Chen Boda, and Kang Sheng. This group of individuals was responsible for navigating the official policy of the Cultural Revolution. Meanwhile, it would be Premier Zhou Enlai who would be responsible for governing everyday affairs in China and maintaining order to prevent things from getting out of hand. It is thanks to him that the Cultural Revolution didn't become even more chaotic than it already was. In the meantime, while most of the party did not support Mao's radical policies, Mao had some close allies in the military and security apparatus who would become key actors in the Cultural Revolution most notably Kang Sheng, chief of China's internal security service, and Marshal Lin Biao, who would become the new Minister of Defense. Lin Biao was one of Mao's closest allies during the Cultural Revolution, and at one point, he was designated to be Mao's successor, right up until his mysterious death, which would become subject to many conspiracies unsolved to this day. Lin Biao was able to carry out many of Mao's orders covertly by corresponding through Mao's wife, Jian Qing. During the Cultural Revolution, Lin Biao was also the man most responsible for propping up Mao's notorious cult of personality, even more than Mao did himself. Leading up to the Cultural Revolution, with the help of Lin Biao, Mao was able to get rid of some high-level officials within the military elite to severely fracture the military apparatus so that they would not be able to get in the way of his Cultural Revolution. 
Initially, many of the higher-ups in the party just assumed that the unfolding purges was just going to be a similar thing to the prior campaigns that were focused on targeting individuals who Mao deemed untrustworthy. So the conservative faction of the party did not quite realize the full extent of the power struggle that had been unfolding, at least not until it was too late. Assuming that Mao was simply just attempting to carry out a few of his typical purges, the party officials could not conceive that Mao's real goal with the Cultural Revolution was to challenge the Communist Party state as a whole. As Mao found his party controlled by people opposed to his more far-left policies, he turned towards new allies outside normal political life, such as the many radicals among the masses themselves. Most of all, radical students, people in the arts, and peasants. Students were encouraged to criticize conservative counter-revolutionary tendencies allegedly held by the professors and teachers, and workers and peasants were encouraged to speak out against the corruption of their bosses and party authorities. This was all made possible thanks to the smear campaigns and purges that dismantled the state apparatus's chain of command, which meant that Mao and the newly formed Cultural Revolution Group were now effectively, although not officially, the ruling entities of the country, and were now capable of launching the Cultural Revolution outside of the party with state forces being too fractured to prevent it. Also, due to Mao's prestige, it was very difficult for party members to speak out openly against the Cultural Revolution policies without losing public support, as it would reinforce suspicions that they were counter-revolutionaries. This reflects a problem that you often see in one-party states. When you really only have one party that people can join, what happens is that all sort of different people with highly different political opinions all join the same party and mask their political differences by couching their proposals in the same language, making political differences seem very ambiguous and hard to detect. You don't really know who's on which side, and this gives rise to all sort of paranoia. The Cultural Revolution did not really officially begin until 1966, when Mao called on the Chinese masses to not only issue criticisms of Communist Party officials, but also to make revolution themselves by advancing the transition away from a capitalist society and towards a communist society. This included not only replacing capitalist culture with so-called proletarian culture, a problematic idea that deserves an entire video of its own, but more importantly, the experimentation with new egalitarian forms of self-organization. While the Cultural Revolution started largely as a revolution from above aimed to incite revolution from below, Mao and the CCRG did not have any sense of a clear plan as to how to orchestrate it or how to control it. By and large, it was an experiment. The most politically active section of the masses during the Cultural Revolution were obviously the independent organizations known as the Red Guards. The Red Guards were not created by Mao or the state. They sprouted up rather spontaneously. The great majority of them were high school students and university students. As the Red Guard movement originally started in secondary schools, then spread to universities, and then spread rapidly to include factory workers and employees in all sorts of sectors, some of these organizations would go on to have their own independent press, with their own newspapers and some would later even become mini-militias. One of the iconic signature tools of the Red Guards was the big character poster, called the Datsu Bao, a poster-sized political essay displayed on a public wall. Big character posters would often display things such as polemics, self-criticisms, announcements, accusations, or exposés of evidence of past political behavior of officials under scrutiny. Red Guards would often turn to radical allies within the party to find leaked documents that would expose information about so-called revisionists or rightists within the party. They would typically investigate teachers, professors, artists, party officials, all sort of different people and look for any evidence that they could find as to whether this person said something in the past or in the present that could indicate that they were a counter-revolutionary, revisionist, or rightist. It was a little bit like what people think cancel culture is. After reading some Red Guard character posters, Mao Zedong, to the shock of his party, sided with the students, and then had some of their messages platformed on national radio and newspapers such as the People's Daily, which was now controlled by his loyalists. Mao's tentative public support of the nascent Red Guard movement turned what was initially just a small group of students into a mass movement that quickly spread all over the nation with workers soon becoming Red Guards as well. For the first time in the history of the People's Republic, and more than in any other time in Chinese history as a whole, the Cultural Revolution allowed workers, peasants, and students to voice their grievances and gave them the freedom to establish their own organizations. The result was the spontaneous emergence of a diverse swarm of popular rebel organizations, all proclaiming fidelity to Mao and the Maoist principles, but interpreting those principles to suit their own particular interests. The Red Guards are typically portrayed to all be blind worshippers of Mao's cult of personality. The famous displays that you see of the masses of Red Guards almost religiously holding up Mao's Red Book paint an image of a superficial unity of Maoist totalitarianism. 
but this distorts the actual carnivalesque reality in which Redguard splintered into a multitude of highly different factions. Despite all claiming the banner of Mao Zedong thought, Mao's fragmentary statements and anti-revisionist communist ideology was interpreted by Red Guards in all sort of ambiguous ways, and were appropriated for many purposes that had little to do with revolution or communism, even though they always cloaked it in revolutionary language. Now here's where things get really complicated. Initially, skeptical party officials such as Liao Shaoxi were reluctant to stop the Cultural Revolution but wanted to contain it before it spiraled into anything dangerous. And more importantly, they wanted to prevent the rebellion from threatening their own power. So they sent out what were officially called work teams to lead the Cultural Revolution, but whose real aim was to contain the mass activity that Mao was trying to encourage. But they veiled their intentions in revolutionary political language so it wasn't immediately obvious. These work teams organized student rebel groups led primarily by the sons and daughters of ruling party officials, and these groups made up much of the early Red Guard organizations. These work teams were formed by personnel from various party organs and schools and universities, and only admitted students from families of workers and peasants, and of course the offspring of revolutionaries in the party. Many workers and peasants became part of these Red Guard groups and took the train to Beijing and Shanghai. Their transportation and housing accommodations were paid for by the party. These early Red Guard groups organized by the work teams would be in opposition to the grassroots Red Guards who sprung up more organically. The Red Guard organizations originally set up by the work teams would go on to be labeled as the conservative Red Guards, due to their role in protecting the party establishment and diverting people's attention away from attacking it. At the same time, more new grassroots rebel groups started to sprout up, which became known as the radical Red Guard factions, and they would come into open conflict with both the conservative Red Guards and, more importantly, the party officials who organized the work teams. The work teams, which the rebellious students had initially welcomed thinking that these teams had been sent by the party's central leadership to help support their critiques and confrontations with the leading officials on the campuses, soon found themselves openly and repeatedly criticized within a few days. A key turning point in the Cultural Revolution was when Mao sided with the grassroots radicals after they reacted negatively to the work teams sent in to moderate the revolution. This is where Mao famously declared to the masses that they had a right to rebel against their authorities and then he called on the security forces to not interfere with the Red Guards. From here, to rebel as justified became the defining slogan of the Cultural Revolution. Student rebels were now free to organize themselves autonomously, unhampered by the dictates of the party organization. The defining moment in which the Cultural Revolution went on to the next level was on August 5th, 1966, when Mao made his own character poster next to the Red Guards that called on the people to bombard the headquarters. This gave the green light to the rebels to collect and leak information on party members suspected of being counter-revolutionaries. Contrary to popular belief, the eradication of bourgeois culture was not the main goal of Mao's cultural revolution, even though he did call for a revolution in culture. Put simply, the main objective of Mao and his allies was to wage a rebellion against the Communist Party itself, namely against those believed to be revisionists in the party taking a capitalist road. Mao's main aim was to regenerate the party's communist orientation and to resurrect class struggle by subjecting party cadres to a process of rough ideological struggle, and he did this by giving power to the masses to hold them accountable. As a result, even though you could argue that this was for Mao's own authoritarian purposes, what he had in effect unleashed, and knowingly so, was a period of radical decentralization and mob rule, a sort of anti-authoritarian politics. The quasi-anti-authoritarian character of Mao's Cultural Revolution is even acknowledged by some anti-communist scholars, who are at least honest enough to admit the paradox that a supposed totalitarian dictator would encourage his people to think for themselves and give them the means to rebel against his own party state. The whole stereotype of totalitarianism is that the government concentrates all power and gives none to its population. What kind of totalitarian dictator takes power away from the government and gives it to his people? Mao's intentions to redirect power away from the bureaucracy and enhance the power of the masses were matched by his actions. Mao encouraged popular rebellion by allowing levels of freedom and transparency that were unprecedented for China. Independent Red Guard organizations were allowed to create their own press, newspapers, publish articles against various politicians, and holding the government accountable by investigating party leaders and finding and distributing their speeches and transcripts from their meetings. Information that was typically considered to be highly classified, but could be used as evidence to see if bureaucrats were guilty of corruption, or just things that Maoists think are bad, like revisionism. Far from totalitarianism, the Cultural Revolution was actually more about the delegitimization of authority. Throw the Emperor off his horse was a popular slogan among Cultural Revolution rebels. 
Hell, even the CCP under Deng Xiaoping admitted that the greatest danger of the Cultural Revolution was that it destroyed the authority of the CCP. With the Cultural Revolution, Mao wanted to reverse a pattern in Chinese political culture where independent thinking and honest opinions were discouraged, due to state authorities behaving like what Chinese peasants called local emperors, which was heavily encouraged by the Confucian tradition of sacralizing authority. One of the reasons why proponents of the Cultural Revolution opposed Confucianism was that they wanted to debase authority and subject these local emperors to mass criticism. While this might be quite the pill to swallow, the Cultural Revolution was actually when freedom of speech and freedom of the press was most widespread in Chinese history. That being said, the right to rebel during the Cultural Revolution was not a right inherent to the people but one granted to them by Mao and his allies, and thus it could just as easily be revoked by him. It's easy to argue that Mao just championed free speech solely because it was convenient for his anti-revisionist motives at the time, rather than upholding free speech as a right in and of itself. However, even though there is some truth to this, it does not change the reality that China during the Cultural Revolution gave far more freedom and power to the masses than they had been given at any time time in history, even if this freedom turned into anarchic chaos quite fast. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves and get back to the timeline as to how the Cultural Revolution unraveled. It's still year 1966. The conservative Red Guards that sprung out of the work teams which we were talking about were not able to curb the students' activism. They were not able to control the mass activity how they wanted, so they could only redirect the swarm away from the most important targets, the revisionist party officials particularly the ones who Mao and his followers deemed to be corrupt, revisionist, or capitalist rotors. Under the direction of party officials like Liu Shaoxi, these conservative Red Guards directed by the work teams attempted to redirect attention towards more insignificant targets, like people with bad class backgrounds, objects of bourgeois culture, like monuments and statues, and so-called bourgeois authorities. As the most powerful high-ranking officials usually had access to some sort of protection, the targets that became the most easily identifiable as bourgeois authorities ended up just being intellectuals, professors, teachers, writers, artists, and others who were virtually defenseless against the swarm that was to come. Surely one of the most degenerative aspects of the Cultural Revolution was the awful treatment of intellectuals and teachers. They became easy victims of opportunists and delinquents filled with resentment. Intellectuals became the political scapegoats of all factions of the Red Guards, radical and conservative alike. They were hounded by Red Guards zealously seeking out the bourgeoisie in a country that had effectively abolished the bourgeoisie. And party officials not only allowed this to happen, but even chimed in on the criticism of intellectuals, as they sought to deflect the political assault away from themselves. Intellectuals would frequently have their homes ransacked by student Red Guards, and had their books burned and work destroyed. The alleged political sins of these intellectuals would often have consequences for their own family members, who would often find themselves subjected to what were called struggle sessions, which were quite psychologically and sometimes physically antagonizing. Now these struggle sessions and what were sometimes called study and criticism sessions sound fine in theory and non-violent, the problem with mob justice is that they can often turn violent very easily, as there's no state mediator. Most of the terrible excesses that many remember from the early years of the Cultural Revolution were not a result of state totalitarianism, but anarchic mob justice. During this time, research in the social sciences and humanities all but ceased, while scientific and technological institutes were afraid of being disparaged as bourgeois specialists, and writers and academics were terrified of having revisionist opinions. As a result, significantly less academic work was published during this time. Artists and musicians were also pretty terrified, unless they chose to openly use their skills to support the Cultural Revolution. And to be fair, some of the art during this time was pretty cool. But it certainly does seem like quite the paradox that giving a ton of free speech and freedom of association to the masses and allowing them to rebel against the state allowed for a far less pluralistic environment than had existed before. How could more freedom lead to less freedom? Well, as we will see repeatedly throughout this video, authoritarianism is not limited to state authorities. A certain anti-authoritarian authoritarianism also exists. Student Red Guards would ransack bookstores to purge any Chinese or foreign literature that they saw as revisionist or bourgeois, which is especially ironic considering that Mao and especially his wife Jian Qing were huge connoisseurs of Western literature and art themselves. To say the least, if Jian Qing was not Mao's wife, she would be heavily persecuted. And this of course brings us to the famous campaign to break the four olds. Old ideas, old customs, old culture, and old habits. More or less the conservative remnants of Chinese culture that were deemed to be oppressive. 
Student Red Guards would also chastise their fellow citizens for what they deemed to be little bourgeois tendencies like certain hairstyles, shoes, tight pants, perfume, pets, gambling, jewelry, dirty jokes, or bourgeois western habits. The Red Guards would waste their time on other symbolic nonsense such as changing street names and destroying statues. Like for example, changing one of the streets to Anti-Revisionist Road. During this time, the Beijing Red Guards raided more than 100,000 homes in search of reactionary materials forcing intellectuals and artists and journalists and all sorts to conduct self-criticisms or face the struggle sessions. Much of the mindless violence that occurred during this early period of the Cultural Revolution stemmed from the fact that the country had been essentially turned over to gangs of high school students. Literal teenagers. I mean, just think about it, it's like every boomer's worst nightmare. A lot of delinquents would just use Mao Zedong thought and revisionism as excuses to get back at teachers they didn't like. Again, one crucial angle that is almost always missed in the mainstream accounts of these events is that the persecution of intellectuals and artists during the start of the Cultural Revolution was not just the doing by Maoist radicals, but also by the party-organized rebels. You know, those conservative Red Guards organized by the work teams, whose intent was to redirect attention away from the party bureaucrats. This might seem a little confusing at first. Although it was Chen Boda of the Cultural Revolution Group who officially launched the Four Olds campaign, as the scholar Alessandro Russo puts it in his book Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture, The conservative Red Guard organizations were responsible in the summer of 1966 for perpetrating some of the most gratuitous acts of violence against bourgeois elements. Most of the latter came from families that had been well off before 1949 but that often carried no political weight at the time. Some were artists and writers who became easy targets for the demagogy of petty politicians. Frequently, police commissariats even provided the students with the addresses of bourgeois elements. Most of the current images of blind destructiveness wreaked by the Red Guards hark back to these episodes. On the whole, destroying the four old things was an ambiguous campaign seemingly supported at the highest levels of the party, whose aim was to direct the attention of student movements toward irrelevant objectives and deflect it from the real issues. By orienting student activism towards a series of obvious class enemies, it would be easier for those who were assigned to counteract pluralization to keep the situation under control. Now this all might be a little surprising to hear. However, just as Mao Zedong did not have total control over the more radical Red Guards whom he preferred, Liu Shaoxi and the party members trying to protect themselves also lost control over the conservative Red Guards. And it would all soon backfire on Liu Shaoxi, who would eventually meet his tragic demise due to the radical Red Guards. Now, none of this is to say that the radical grassroots factions of the Red Guards did not also perpetrate a lot of violence or that Mao Zedong himself was not responsible for inciting the revolt in the first place. The point is that the conservative Old Guard of the Communist Party who organized the work teams are just as much responsible for this, and this is rarely ever acknowledged by most mainstream portrayals of the Cultural Revolution. It was actually the conservative Red Guards who most heavily pushed the notorious bloodline theory. One of the most stupid, self-destructive, and pseudo-political trends in the early years of the Cultural Revolution. It was kind of like a class identity politics. According to bloodline theory, children of workers, poor peasants, and revolutionary cadres were assumed to be more likely to be natural revolutionaries, while the children of capitalists and landlords were assumed to be political agents of counter-revolution. And many Red Guards would waste their time bullying these people with bad class backgrounds. No doubt this absurd biological classism was a degeneration that had nothing to do with Marxist theory. And by deflecting attention to these imagined enemies of the revolution, this bloodline theory conveniently distracted people from these so-called capitalist rotors within the party and Mao's call to experiment with new communist forms of organization. While Mao Zedong did not start this bloodline theory, he is still partially to blame for this type of class identity politics. Mao and his followers had a tendency to loosely use terms like revisionist, capitalist, and bourgeois as quasi-moral identitarian categories that consequently became meaningless buzzwords. So it only makes sense that the Red Guards would parrot this tendency in practice. While not controlled by Mao, the behavior of the Red Guards cannot be separated from the anti-intellectual and anti-urban impulses seen in Mao Zedong thought at the time. It was also Mao who placed such a big emphasis on the five black categories, considered enemies of the revolution, which were landlords, rich farmers, counter-revolutionaries, bad influences slash bad elements, and rightists. Those last two categories are especially vague. Even though Mao did believe that individuals whose parents came from such class backgrounds could be reformed and redeemed, they were still viewed with suspicion. 
See, this is the problem with understanding the transition towards communism solely in terms of the abolition of class antagonisms, rather than the creation of alternative modes of organization. In a movement defined by such an extreme obsession with class identity and the elimination of a bourgeoisie, the revival of class struggle in a society that barely had any class distinctions left, as China no longer really had a bourgeoisie, big capitalists and big landlords had all been virtually eliminated, led to a lot of this class struggle being very insignificant with very little meaningful political content. In the following quote, Richard Krauss brilliantly illustrates the superfluousness of much of what was called class struggle during this time. The villages, for all their diversity, reenacted a revival of class struggle, in which the classes were essentially historical rather than ongoing. Members of local poor and lower middle peasants associations provided the basis for local communist party power. This majority scrutinized a small minority who belonged to the five black categories. Few villages had any rightists, but if so, they were intellectuals. But all villages had family members of former landlords and rich peasants, few of whom constituted any threat to the revolution. Most were victimized until after the end of the Cultural Revolution, in both significant and petty ways. A landlord's daughter could not join the party or militia and would be unlikely to find recommendations for educational opportunities. A rich peasant's son would find few brides willing to assume the stigma of his class. Before 1949, the poorest male peasants could not marry, so many peasants probably regarded the new order as rough justice. Sometimes the class language of the Cultural Revolution simply masked persistent older forms of village politics, such as lineage rivalries. In broad terms, the rural class relations had mutated into something akin to a caste system, where barriers to social relations and intermarriage became deeper than actual property distinctions. The main point here is that a lot of this pseudo-class struggle distracted people from what was the real problem that Mao had identified being the leadership of the Communist Party itself, which Mao believed was becoming a new bourgeoisie. Mao genuinely believed that the centralization of state power unaccountable to the masses would lead to the formation of a new bureaucratic elite, with class interests at odds with the working class and oppressed masses. He believed that many within the bureaucracy would develop bourgeois inclinations, giving them the incentive to abandon class struggle and quietly take a capitalist road, instead of maintaining fidelity to the communist goal of a stateless, classless society. Mao famously declared that, quote, The representatives of the bourgeoisie who have infiltrated the party, the government, the army, and various cultural sectors are a group of counter-revolutionary revisionists. Once the conditions are ripe, they will seize power and transform the proletarian dictatorship into a bourgeois dictatorship. Some of them we have already identified, but not others. Others, for example, individuals like Khrushchev, who still enjoy our trust, are being trained as our successors and can be found at present among us. Even though Mao's anti-revisionist narrative about a new bourgeoisie developing in the party was not really true economically, his broader suspicion had a lot of truth politically. While the party bureaucracy was not yet an actual class in an economic sense, much of the party's old guard were starting to shift away from the revolutionary political goals of actually emancipating the masses and creating a communist alternative, you know, supposedly one of the main goals of communism. But instead, much of the communist party leadership were comfortable with just stabilizing the rule of the party state and gradually modernizing the country. And this was a regression in the eyes of Mao. While Mao is certainly not typically thought of as a libertarian, Mao really did believe that much of the Communist Party state had become increasingly corrupt, abused power, and became disconnected from the people. And so did many Chinese. It was not just Maoist radical fanatics who participated in the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution movement empowered many workers, students, and peasants who harbored bitter resentments against party cadres. And much of these resentments were against their local party officials not merely just a specific handful of anti-socialist rightists. Without this reality of deep-seated popular resentment against bureaucratic privilege, it is quite difficult to explain why millions of ordinary Chinese responded to Mao's call to rebel. The Cultural Revolution entered a new phase when the Red Guard assaults moved from attacking the Four Olds to actually attacking party officials and administrative cadres and this started to happen at an increasing rate after Mao had chastised Liu Xiaoxi and his work teams for trying to contain the mass activity, where he called on the masses to bombard the headquarters. 
Many state authorities and some party officials were now being paraded throughout the streets in dunce caps, forced to confess their crimes at public rallies. Eventually, Red Guards would expose questionable evidence that Liu Xiaoxi had collaborated with the KMT nationalists during the Chinese Civil War, which Mao would later use to imprison him. Now, what I'm about to say will probably disappoint some of the Maoists in the audience, but I think Liu Xiaoxi's death was quite a tragedy. I just don't buy the Maoist narrative that he was some sort of evil traitor just for supporting market reforms in a time of transition. After all, Mao's economic plan was a catastrophe. Originally, Mao didn't want to go after Liu Xiaoxi directly, but when the Red Guards ultimately went after him and subjugated him to all that psychological torture, Mao just let it all happen. It is important to elucidate that Mao did not intend on fully eliminating all of the revisionist party members per se, as Stalin did. And as we will see, it was none other than Mao himself who would later reinvite Deng Xiaoping and many of the old guards back into power. With the Cultural Revolution, Mao mainly wanted to use the rebellion to force the party cadres to adopt an anti-revisionist line, which for Mao basically meant continuing class struggle and preventing a conservative counter-revolution. See, Chairman Mao was thinking that if you just turn up the heat all the way and let all the Red Guards loose, they'd rid the whole party of any revisionist sentiments and nobody would dare contemplate taking a capitalist road. However, what Mao didn't anticipate was that as things progressed, this was also the perfect environment to go settle scores with whoever you had a beef with. Whether it be in your workplace, school, school's administration, university, neighborhoods, local party communities, or friend circles. So basically, the language of Mao's ideas ended up being co-opted to rationalize things like hollow rivalries and petty interpersonal conflicts. Young people especially used the Cultural Revolution as an excuse to just get revenge on whoever they disliked, and rebel against their parents and teachers. We really don't need to dwell on all of the endless examples of Red Guard violence and psychological humiliation that the Cultural Revolution produced. Many people already know about the infamous struggle sessions where targets were ostracized for bad opinions, public denunciations where targets had to wear dunce caps and walk through the street parades, and public humiliations which sometimes succeeded into brutal torturous acts. This is usually the only side of the Cultural Revolution that is highlighted by most portrayals of it. But it is worth highlighting before we get into some of the more good things about the Cultural Revolution which we discuss in the second half of the video. Already well into the early period of the Cultural Revolution, many people who saw what was happening and could see the writing on the wall tried to protect themselves from becoming targets themselves by joining in on the dogpiling and proactively going on the offensive to attack people who were supposedly counter-revolutionary, revisionist, or had bad class backgrounds, often turning against their friends and sometimes even family members. All sort of media was taking place in the high schools especially, where children were being persecuted for the alleged political sins or social origins of their parents, and parents were being denounced by their children. No one can deny that the Cultural Revolution left a lot of people psychologically traumatized. Needless to say, it was a time of enormous human suffering. While Mao bared the responsibility of originally inciting the revolts, most of the worst acts of cruelty occurred against Mao's will or without his knowledge. The decentralized nature of the Cultural Revolution and the sheer geographic size of China and the lack of technological resources capable of monitoring all the activity in each city or rural area made it practically impossible for the Cultural Revolution to be controlled from above. Violence during the radical period was carried out by a loud overrepresented minority, and the anarchic lawless nature of the Red Guard revolts allowed a lot of things to happen which weren't supposed to happen. One should not imagine the Cultural Revolution as an entire decade of beatings and murders. As insane as all the anarchic chaos was, it only really lasted less than two years. For the most part, the biggest victim of Red Guard violence during the Cultural Revolution would be none other than the Red Guards themselves. Already by 1967 to 1968, many of the Red Guard organizations started splitting up into factions and began savagely fighting each other. This would get increasingly worse as time went on. The PLA, the People's Liberation Army, had started to intervene more and more to maintain order as things became more chaotic. Mao knew that he always had to maintain the military support. And although he would have Lin Biao on his side, Mao would be initially suspicious that many people in the PLA harbored rightist tendencies who might conspire to launch a coup in response to the Cultural Revolution. In a letter to his wife, Jian Qing, Mao estimated that, quote, 75% of the PLA officer corps supported the right, and concluded that this, quote, made it imperative to now arm the left. So as a result, Mao now allowed many Red Guard groups to get access to arms, allowing some of them to basically become paramilitary units. 
Initially, Mao allowed Red Guard rebels to expose so-called rightists in the military and subject them to self-criticisms and struggle sessions. But all hell broke loose after it became okay for Red Guards to expose capitalist rotors in the army, setting the stage for what would practically become an all-out civil war. You would have Red Guard units not only fighting each other, but fighting against local army units. And to make things even more confusing, the PLA sometimes backed different Red Guard groups that they preferred to fight against the ones that they opposed. Different Red Guard factions would fight each other to seize power over certain regions that were supposedly controlled by revisionists or corrupt party officials. Examples of notable factional battles include the famous Wuhan incident. An armed conflict between two hostile factions who were fighting for control over the city of Wuhan in 1967. The rapidly increasing factional battles were often bloody and usually inconclusive and surprisingly often lacked political content. A major paradox of the Cultural Revolution that is rarely talked about is that much of the factional fighting that took place was of a surprisingly depoliticized nature. This is one of the most fascinating insights that sociologist Andrew Walder confirms in his research presented in his book Agents of Disorder. In his empirical study, Walder demonstrates how much of the factionalism during the Cultural Revolution had little to no connection with political differences or class interests and rather that much of the factional fighting was primarily based on the annihilation of rival factions and the seizure of power. This is a rather bleak reality that would surprise many Maoists, who would prefer not to believe that so many factional conflicts were over such hollow goals. In an essay published in 2006, the excellent Chinese scholar Wang Hui wrote that, quote, The tragedy of the Cultural Revolution was not a product of its politicization, signified by debate, theoretical investigation, autonomous social organization, as well as the spontaneity and vitality of political and discursive space. Rather, it was a result of depolitization, polarized factional struggles that eliminated the possibility for autonomous social spheres transferring political debate into a mere means of power struggle, and class into an essentialized identitarian concept. As we saw, Mao initially sided with the young rebels by allowing them to attack revisionist tendencies within the military. But this backfired massively. By late August of 1967, China had been sinking into total chaos. By this point, Mao now became convinced that to continue the Cultural Revolution as a movement based on the initiative of the masses was to run the risk of a massive civil war. So Mao decided to side more fully with the military and opted for order. And in effect, the end of the Cultural Revolution as a mass movement. In September 1967, the PLA was officially instructed to restore order with Mao's consent. The masses were now instructed to turn in their arms and were forbidden to interfere with the mission of the PLA. Students were urged to return to their schools, and many Red Guard rebels were now being sent to the countryside to learn from the peasants. The whole attempt to quell the Cultural Revolution and the return to normalcy was decorated with an abundance of revolutionary rhetoric, retaining many of the slogans and battle cries of the Cultural Revolution. But it was made clear that the right of the masses to rebel had been withdrawn. The PLA began to carry out mass arrests and mass executions of Red Guards who still refused to back down and surrender. Andrew G. Walder found that the vast majority of deaths and victims generated by the events of 1966 to 1969 were at the hands of military authorities. The military's attempt to crush the Cultural Revolution resulted in about five times as many casualties as the mass violence that had occurred during the Cultural Revolution before the military crackdown. Andrew Walder sums up these unknown revelations deduced in his study at the end quote of his book. The casualties generated by the rebel insurgencies and violent factionalism of 1967 and 1968 were dwarfed by those due to the repression of rebel groups and the subsequent rebuilding of the political order. The vast majority of deaths and victims generated by the events of 1966 to 1969 were at the hands of military or civilian authorities. This may surprise those whose impressions of the Cultural Revolution are shaped by reading horrific accounts of cruelty and violence committed by the Red Guards and the rebels in schools and workplaces, or dramatic descriptions of chaotic civil unrest and armed battles during the upheavals of 1967 and 1968. Throughout this period, actors typically viewed as the forces of order fueled and accelerated the upheavals and the damage that they wrought in ways that could not have been anticipated by the presumed political interests of the groups at the outset. This is the most sobering and perhaps the most frightening of the conclusions to be drawn from this study. By the early 1970s, Mao Zedong took partial responsibility for the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. 
Admitting that his actions to approve the big character poster and calling on the masses to bombard the headquarters had caused a lot of unforeseen damage. Mao stated that, quote, I myself had not foreseen that the whole country would be thrown into turmoil. Since it was I who caused the havoc, it is understandable if you have some bitter words for me. By 1970, the mass phase of the Cultural Revolution was essentially over. And by 1973, much of the old guard party cadres who had been removed during the Cultural Revolution were now restored to power. But the Cultural Revolution would not officially end until Mao's death in 1976. After the end of the phase of mass revolt, the Cultural Revolution mainly consisted of socioeconomic reforms, mainly in education. Things sort of went back to normal. Prior to the onset of the Cultural Revolution, China was in a period of relative stability. After finally recovering from Japanese imperialism, the Chinese Civil War, and the Great Leap Forward, so why would Mao decide to risk throwing away this relative stability by inciting the Cultural Revolution? As mentioned at the start of this video, many mainstream interpretations of the Cultural Revolution like to rationalize Mao's encouragement of rebellion against his own party as some sort of cunning ploy to galvanize the masses against his own political enemies just so that he could come back to power and establish his own absolute authority. They incorrectly assume that Mao was some sort of cynical Machiavellian who did not care about China or anyone other than himself. They assume that Mao did not actually believe in the ideology that he preached, that his belief in the masses was just for show. This is a largely incorrect but convenient narrative, not only for anti-communists, but also for socialists who want to distance themselves from failed socialist experiments, and find an excuse and a grand narrative for why they failed. While it does not tell us the full story, the accusation that the Cultural Revolution was a big ploy from out to get rid of his adversaries is not without basis. Proponents of this theory like to compare the Cultural Revolution with the 100 Flowers campaign of 1957, which was also an attempt of Mao to encourage the masses to express their criticisms of the party. While initially the campaign to let 100 flowers bloom was presented as a democratic endeavor, it was later followed by an anti-rightist campaign where thousands of people who expressed criticisms perceived as counter-revolutionary were denounced as bourgeois rightists. Ultimately, the 100 Flowers campaign was indeed an attempt to weed out the people that Mao and his faction did not like. But unlike the Cultural Revolution, it was not actually aimed at challenging the power of the party state. Contrary to popular belief, the Cultural Revolution was not just an attempt for Mao to bolster his own power. Mao's cult of personality had already been a fixture for years prior to the onset of the Cultural Revolution. And by the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, Mao had already regained a lot of his power and influence. Mao was indeed trying to enhance his influence so that he could influence the masses. To rebel. While Mao did use this rebellion to discourage what he saw as revisionist tendencies and capitalist rotors, the motive of power does not explain why he encouraged the creation of organizations that were independent from the state. There was no real interest for him to do so. While Mao could not have fully anticipated the cataclysmic degree to which the Cultural Revolution spiraled out of control, it would be unreasonable to assume that Mao was foolish enough not to consider the potential risks of inciting mass revolt against his own party state. But it was the price he was willing to pay to empower the masses. But why? Why would Mao, who had done so much to build up China's regime into what it was until 1966, decide to risk its stability and authority? For many interpreters of the Cultural Revolution, this is quite a paradox. But a careful examination of the trajectory of Mao's thought and behavior shows that his decision to call for an assault against his own party state was not a paradox, but instead simply reveals that Mao, leader of the Communist Party of China, was indeed a communist who believed in communism. Say what you want about Mao, but the guy really was a believer in communism. He was so determined to build communism as fast as possible that he may have ignored Marx's original conviction that a country must go through a stage of capitalist development first before a society is wealthy and industrialized enough to move towards communism. That's boring. Mao famously disagreed with those who believed that communism just meant the raising of living standards. In order for the revolutionary spirit not to get lost, Mao believed that the masses need to be continually repoliticized and to experiment with new forms of egalitarian organization. Mao's decision to embrace mass revolt against his own party was not a paradox, but was consistent with a long-running theme in his thinking regarding the process of revolution. See, unlike most communist leaders who believed in the doctrine of historical materialism, Mao did not believe that communism was inevitable or that history was progressive in a linear way. Instead of assuming the inevitability of capitalism's collapse and socialism's victory, Mao assumed probable defeat that the defeat of the revolution and the restoration of capitalism was the most likely possibility. For Mao, victory was the mother of many illusions. 
causing the people to become complacent and vulnerable to counter-revolution or to covert capitalist restoration. And who would be the one to sabotage this road to socialism? Unlike many other communist leaders, Mao was convinced that it was not just foreign enemies and intruders who threatened socialism, but rather the greatest threat to socialism would be none other than the Communist Party itself. While concerns about bureaucracy sabotaging the revolution have been voiced before, most notably by Trotsky, Lenin, and Stalin, Mao was the first communist leader in power to actually address these concerns in practice by transferring power to the masses themselves, rather than just simply purging bureaucrats from above, like Stalin did. Since it was ostensibly the revisionists inside the party who threatened the revolutionary path, Mao concluded that independent organizations directed by the masses would be required to combat a bourgeois counter-revolution. In doing so, Mao wanted to overcome the mistakes of the bureaucratic Leninist model of state socialism, which is why Mao wanted the masses to challenge the supremacy of the party, which in Marxist Leninist regimes was typically considered to be the primary locus of revolution. It would be ridiculous to question the party because the party was supposed to represent the masses. Mao still believed in the need for a Leninist-style party, but he insisted that the masses themselves must take a more direct role in socialist construction. In his book titled The Communist Hypothesis, the philosopher Alain Baidu argued that what would emerge during the first two years of the Cultural Revolution was a new incipient form of egalitarian mass politics that was semi-independent from the party state but still constrained by statist logic. One of the most remarkable achievements of the Chinese Cultural Revolution was the expansion and democratization of education, even though some of these achievements were later reversed. Cultural Revolution era education reforms allowed tens of thousands of young people living in rural areas to receive middle and high school educations for the first time. This is why people who grew up in rural areas, such as peasants, tend to have a different perspective on the Cultural Revolution compared to those who grew up in the cities, as the education reforms created a new curriculum tailored to their local needs. You can read a lot about this in the book titled The Unknown Cultural Revolution, Life and Change in the Chinese Village, by Dongping Han a great Chinese scholar who grew up in a village during the Cultural Revolution. Much of these reforms were expanded throughout the early 1970s, when things cooled down and became a lot more stable compared to the wild years of 1966 to 69. During the decade of the Cultural Revolution, China saw significant increases in adult literacy and average life expectancy. While the 10 official years of the Cultural Revolution is frequently depicted as one big decade of chaos, China's GDP still grew by an average of 6% annually, which was higher than both India and Indonesia during this time. The decade of the Cultural Revolution also saw reforms that allowed students and teachers to criticize educational policies, participate in their reconstitution, and voice criticisms of their party state authorities through local party committees. Probably the most noteworthy and novel achievement of the Cultural Revolution were the efforts made to help narrow the gap between manual and intellectual labor. The idea was to help create a more self-reliant society, where people could learn all sort of different skills. Even though the division of labor can be quite efficient for productivity, it tends to create one-dimensional individuals who don't learn a lot of things outside of their field. It tends to roboticize humanity. For a few months a year, everyone was encouraged to engage in work that they had never done before. Students had to get some experience in the trades and learn some hands-on practical skills from manual laborers, and were also encouraged to get some experience working on farms with peasants. Most importantly, those engaged in manual labor were given more opportunities to study, Blue-collar workers and peasants not only got access to better schooling, they were also given progressive education through things called theory centers, where ordinary factory workers were given the opportunity to study revolutionary theory. I mean, just check out this clip. You don't see this anywhere. Even in the wealthiest countries today, most people still don't have the time or energy to learn things like philosophy, history, and social science. And this was taking place in a poor developing country that was still sanctioned off from most of the world economy. However, what was probably the most significant, innovative development of the Cultural Revolution was the plurality of egalitarian self-managed organizations. In the beginning, the Cultural Revolution promised fundamental changes. For instance, the official 16 points for the Great Cultural Revolution issued by Mao and the CCRG in August 1966 declared that, quote, Many new things have begun to emerge in the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. The cultural revolutionary groups, committees, and other organizational forms created by the masses in many schools and units are something new and of great historic importance. These cultural revolutionary groups, committees, and congresses are excellent new forms of organization whereby under the leadership of the Communist Party, the masses are educating themselves. 
They are an excellent bridge to keep our party in close contact with the masses. They are organs of power of the proletarian cultural revolution. The cultural revolutionary groups, committees, and congresses should not be temporary organizations, but permanent, standing mass organizations. They are suitable not only for colleges, schools, government, and other organizations, but generally also for factories, mines, and other enterprises, urban districts, and villages. It is necessary to institute a system of general elections, like that of the Paris Commune, for electing members of the cultural revolutionary groups and committees and delegates to the Cultural Revolutionary Congress. This mission was reiterated in an article published in January 31st of 1967, titled The Proletarian Revolutionaries Struggle to Seize Power, where Mao states that, quote, Through a period of transition, the wisdom of the broad masses will be brought into full play, and a completely new organizational form of political power, better suited to the socialist economic base, will be created. The radical period of the Cultural Revolution between 66 and 68 saw the birth of an unrestricted plurality of political organizations, independent from and sometimes antagonistic to the party state. See, this was a very big deal. Prior to this, it was essentially unheard of for state socialist regimes to permit, much less encourage, ordinary citizens to form independent political organizations on such a mass scale. Tens of thousands of autonomous organizations and communist projects were created by the masses themselves. This included political groups, self-managed factories, worker peasant run universities, proletarian theaters, collective canteens, cooperative medical services, democratic schools, and communes. Sometimes these organizations would act in line with the party while others did not. Many of them did not, with many of the political groups actually launching assaults against civil and military authorities which Mao initially supported, but then turned against. And of course, most notably, there was the famous Shanghai Commune of 1966, which was modeled off of the famous Paris Commune. In his book, Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture, Alessandro Russo illuminates the significance of the Shanghai Commune. The Shanghai January Storm and the creation of other autonomous egalitarian projects marked a dramatic face-to-face -face encounter between a vision of communism as a set of experimental inventions which the self-organization of the rebels brought into the political arena, and the vision of communism as a form of government, which was then hegemonic in the socialist states. However, the Shanghai Commune barely lasted a month, and as things progressed, Mao eventually had second thoughts about the Commune and rejected it in favor of a more moderate form of organization, opting instead for the military-dominated revolutionary committees. Mao justified this in the name of facilitating more unity among the Red Guards, who already by this time began imploding into rival factions competing for the seizure of power. This marked the point where Mao took a more conservative turn and began to retreat from his original mission to incite revolt against his own party, stating that, We must believe that more than 90% of our cadres are good or comparatively good. The majority of those who have made mistakes can be reformed. Mao moved to eliminate the more anarchistic tendencies that he unleashed the year before. Radical groups who refused to abide by the rule of the Revolutionary Committee and rebelled against the CCRG's orders were all now labeled as counter-revolutionary ultra-leftists, which was quite a sudden change considering that Mao represented the more radical faction of his party and encouraged the rebellions of the more ultra-leftists. By 1969, the attacks on party officials largely ceased, and many of the party cadres who had been dismissed from power were now being restored back to office, including Deng Xiaoping. One could interpret this either as Mao waking up to the need for pragmatism or as a betrayal of the revolution. A possible interpretation of these events may be that the egalitarian independent organizations failed due to state intervention, and Mao's decision to abandon the original radical mission of the Cultural Revolution. However, such an interpretation would miss the fact that the independent organizations which sprouted up during the first two years of the Cultural Revolution had already begun to self-destruct and cannibalize each other in a bloody factional struggle before the military was sent in to stop them. This is the most crucial object of study examined in the Cultural Revolution and Revolutionary Culture book that we keep mentioning. And I noticed that the question concerning the self-destruction of these egalitarian organizations is where many of the Maoists do not have an answer because most of them don't analyze why they failed. And studying this is where we can really begin to extract lessons from this event. In the mid-70s, Mao in his final years wanted to open up a debate and a research initiative to assess the Cultural Revolution, to examine its failures and achievements. Mao did not actually believe that his thought had absolute authority. 
which is why he invited some of his adversaries back to power like Deng Xiaoping, so that they could reassess what happened in order to seek out new solutions and new ideas. The final initiatives launched by Mao were essentially study movements that aimed at critically examining some key controversial theoretical issues that the Cultural Revolution had reignited. This included the Movement for the Study of the Theory of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat in 1975. With these initiatives, Mao wanted people to rethink the obstacles to the communist transition, and what communist social relations in general should look like. In 1976, after Mao's death and the prosecution of the Gang of Four, Deng Xiaoping chose to block these study initiatives entirely. While Deng Xiaoping's more pragmatic thinking may have been good for revitalizing China's economy, it pretty much abandoned any project towards emancipation. Most crucially, the CPC under Deng Xiaoping suppressed any investigation into the radical experiments in egalitarian mass organizations that occurred during the Cultural Revolution, and the controversial questions that it posed concerning things like the dictatorship of the proletariat. Thus, the task of investigating the experiments of the Cultural Revolution is left up to socialists of the 21st century, throughout the world, assuming that contemporary socialists want to actually learn from the mistakes of the past. In the next video, we shall turn towards some of the key factors that led to the collapse of the Cultural Revolution and the lessons we can learn. This video took an enormous amount of work, from all of the research, turning it into a script, collecting images and footage, not to mention editing, which you will rarely see on YouTube when it comes to complicated events. One Dime is a fan-funded project, but unfortunately I can't guarantee if it will be sustainable in the long term. A few bucks on Patreon won't be much for one person. But if enough fans of this channel pledge your support, One Dime could certainly become a full-time project. Thank you very much to the patrons who have supported me so far. See you in the next video.